Hi everyone, my name is Mark, and today we're going to take a look at another horrible case with you. On June 7th, 2021, at 10.05 p.m., the South Carolina Law Enforcement Division received a call that two people were shot dead at a residence in Islandton, South Carolina. Alex Murdo called 911 to report that his 52-year-old wife, Margaret Murdo, and their 22-year-old son, Paul, had been shot in the dog kennels on their family's 1,770-acre hunting lodge, the Moselle. Based on this cell phone data, investigators believe the killings happened between 8.49 and 9.06 p.m. The South Carolina Law Enforcement Division, SLED officers, arrived on the scene to a distraught Alex standing in front of the kennels. Inside were the bodies of his youngest son and wife. They'd suffered multiple gunshot wounds from different weapons. When the police asked Alex why anyone would want his family dead, he told them about the strange threats his son, Paul, had been receiving. A boating accident had occurred earlier that year, and their handling of the situation might have earned the family some enemies. This is a long story. My son was in a boat wreck a few months back. He's been getting threats. The news of the murders of one of Hampton's most beloved families rocked the sleepy town to its core. Despite the tragedy gaining national attention, it would take more than a year for law enforcement to make their first arrest. While the police worked in the background, the question on everybody's mind was, who killed Maggie and Paul and why? However strange the murder might have seemed, what followed after was far more bizarre. Their death triggered a series of events that unearthed the secrets of Alex Mardaw and led to what the media have come to call one of the most high-profile and sensational cases in South Carolina legal history. Richard Alexander Alex Murdaugh was born into a legal dynasty on May 27, 1968. The Murdaughs are a respected and well-connected family of lawyers who have dominated South Carolina Low Country's legal system for over 100 years. Three generations of the family have served as district attorneys of the 14th Judicial Circuit from 1920 to 2006. Their reign came to a startling end with Alex Murdo. The Murdo laid the foundation for the titan they would become today when Alex's great-grandfather, Randolph Murdo Sr., founded the law firm Peters, Murdo, Parker, Eltsroth, and Amp Dietrich, PMPD. Over the decades, their influence grew so great the Hamptons became known as Murdo County. Alex Murdo tried to follow in his family's footsteps when he was old enough and pursued a law degree from the University of North Carolina. There he met his beautiful wife, Margaret Maggie Bransletter. They started seeing each other in 1991 and wed two years later on August 14, 1993, at the Second Presbyterian Church in South Carolina. Alex and Maggie had two sons, Richard Buster Murdo and Paul Murdo. Alex Murdo became a personal injury attorney with his family firm, PMPD, trying to continue his family's legacy. However, unlike the generations of Murdo that's come before, Alex abused the power and influence his family's firm gave him, using it to cover up financial crimes, theft, and some have even speculated murder. His underhanded dealings would go unnoticed for over a decade, until his youngest son, Paul, was involved in a boating accident that left a girl dead. Paul's boating accident was just the latest in a long line of suspicious deaths surrounding the Murdaugh family. People speculate that these accidental deaths were not so accidental and were part of a larger cover-up. Given the Murdaugh family history and resources, the theory seemed likely, especially with how they handled the death of Mallory Beach. Paul Murdo drove the family boat to a party on Pucas Island on February 23, 2019. Fresh out of high school, Paul and his girlfriend, Morgan Doughty, Anthony Cook, Mallory Beach, and Miley Altman were hankering for a party and an unsupervised night of fun. The plan was to kick the night off with a house party and the oyster roast on the island. Parties were a non-starter without alcohol, so Paul scored some beer and hard liquor using his older brother's identity card. They departed from the Mardaw River House by 7 p.m. By midnight, they were raring for even more fun. So Paul insisted on driving the boat to downtown Beaufort, where he and Connor downed two rounds of shots. At around 1 a.m., they headed back to the boat, and on their way back, a surveillance camera captured a tender moment between Anthony and Mallory as they made their way back. By this point, Paul had a lot of alcohol in his system, 
and according to the other passengers, he started acting strange. At 1.15 a.m., they were on the water again, and the situation spiraled out of control. The group started arguing with Paul when he started driving in circles and acting drunk. Miley said that Anthony demanded he let him out on a nearby rock, but he refused. Morgan later said that Paul left the boat's steering wheel more than once to argue with her, and Mallory was terrified. According to GPS footage drawn from the onboard Garmin GPS, the boat sped up at some point, and although Paul denies ramping up the boat's speed, he was steering. The boat crashed into Arher's Creek Bridge at 2.20 a.m., and Mallory was ejected into the water. The rest of the teens did not come out untouched either. Connor had a broken jaw, while Morgan's hand was badly injured. Connor called 911 and help arrived shortly after. The teenagers were an utter mess when the Beaufort County Deputy Sheriff arrived, and the first thing he noticed was how distressed Anthony was. He reported that he actually tried to rush through him to get to Paul after he saw the latter smiling. The police reported that he saw blood in the main compartment of the boat and a large split from the hull on impact. All the teens were grossly intoxicated, and all of them, except Anthony, were ferried to the hospital to be treated. Everybody agreed to be treated except Paul, who was very agitated and had a blood alcohol level of 0.243 times higher than the legal limit. Alex, Paul's father, was seen that night, shuffling from hospital room to hospital room, trying to calm them down and control the situation. It took the search party eight days to find Mallory's body. The coroner said she died of blunt force trauma to the head and drowning. Despite multiple witnesses, including Morgan, Paul's girlfriend, claiming Paul was out of control at the steering wheel that night, he would not be arrested or even charged. This fueled rumors that Alex Murdo had somehow greased the wheels of justice to get his son free. In March 2019, the Murdo family was slapped with a wrongful death lawsuit. Mallory's family alleged that Paul's mother, Maggie, knew her son was drunk when the group went boarding and knew that Buster had supplied them the ID they needed to purchase alcohol. It wasn't until April 18th, 2019, on Mallory's 20th birthday, that Paul was charged with three felonies for boating under the influence, causing the death of Mallory and seriously injuring two other passengers. Paul pleaded not guilty and was released on a $50,000, Unfortunately, Paul's day in court did not come. He passed on before the courts gave one. Another seemingly accidental death people have linked to the Murdo was the murder of an openly gay teenager, Stephen Smith. He was found dead on July 8, 2015, in the middle of the road in Hampton County, South Carolina. The cause of death was blunt force trauma to the head and was initially ruled as a hit-and-run incident with no suspect arrested. However, the boy's mother believed he was the victim of a hate crime. Stephen had been a classmate of Alex Murdo's oldest son, Buster, back in high school. And the rumor was they were in a relationship. Some speculate that Buster might have been involved in Stephen's death and that the hit-and-run story was a lousy cover-up. The South Carolina Law Enforcement Division, SLED, reopened the case on March 22, 2023, and revealed that his death was a murder. But no suspects have been named. Gloria Satterfield was a longtime housekeeper for Alex Murdo's family. Her death was another seemingly innocent though unfortunate passing. On February 2, 2018, Gloria suffered a severe head injury when she fell down the stairs at the family's Moselle residence. She passed away on February 26, 2018, due to various complications. Alex Murdo had claimed that his dogs had gone to greet Gloria at the top of the stairs but the housekeeper accidentally tripped over them, causing her to fall backward and hit her head. After her passing, there was strangely no autopsy to confirm Alex's version of events. On her death certificate, the cause of death was ruled natural causes. The sons of Gloria Satterfield initiated a wrongful death lawsuit over their mother's death in 2018 and were awarded a dollar for three million insurance policy settlement in October 2020. However, the settlement they won never arrived. Murdo had allegedly hatched a scheme to steal the insurance payout. He approached Gloria's sons and encouraged them to sue him, and even went as far as introducing a lawyer, Corey Fleming, to them. 
Corey Fleming was a longtime friend and godfather to one of Alex Murdo's sons. The two conspired to steal the Satterfields' payout. The money was diverted to Alex's bank account, and they never notified the Satterfields of receiving the insurance settlement. Satterfield's sons then initiated a new civil lawsuit on September 15, 2021, against Alex Murdo. On the same day, state investigators opened a criminal investigation into Gloria Satterfield's death. The reason investigators gave for opening the case was to determine any criminal liability for the death. The decision was based on a request from the Hampton County coroner, who found Gloria's manner of death inconsistent with natural causes. Her family later permitted state authorities to exhume her body for further investigation. By late September 2021, Alex Murdo was facing multiple financial and embezzlement charges. Before the Satterfield brothers filed their first lawsuit against Alex Murdo, he'd been embroiled in financial schemes, fraud, and embezzlement for nearly a decade. Alex was allegedly involved in a money laundering and painkiller ring, which lasted from October 7, 2013, to September 2021, with his distant cousin and eventual partner in crime, Curtis Smith. On September 4, 2021, the pair cooked up another sinister scheme. Alex gave Curtis a gun and directed him to shoot him. Alex's only surviving son, Buster, would receive his life insurance policy when he passed. Curtis pulled up to where Alex had staged a fake flat tire and shot at him as instructed. However, the bullet only caused superficial injuries to Alex, and he was even able to call 911 himself. The moment local law enforcement inspected the scene, they smelt foul play, but they weren't quite able to prove it. It wasn't until days later that Murdo confessed. He admitted to conspiring with Curtis and staging the shooting. His lawyers announced that he was going through a tough time and unsavory elements were taking advantage of his state of mind. They claimed Alex wanted to end his life so that Buster could cash on a $10 million life insurance policy. Alex surrendered himself when he heard a warrant was out for his arrest. He was charged with insurance fraud, conspiracy to commit insurance fraud, and filing a false police report. Just two days after the incident, another perplexing news broke. Alex Murdo announced that he would be resigning from his position in his family's law firm, Peters, Murdo, Parker, Eltsroth, and Amp Dietrich, PMP Ed, and entering rehab for treatment once he left the hospital. He was quoted saying, made a lot of decisions that I truly regret. Another bombshell dropped just hours later when his firm released an official statement alleging Murdo had misappropriated $792,000 of company funds. The firm's CFO had confronted him earlier about the missing money and then reported him to relevant authorities. The South Carolina Supreme Court indefinitely suspended Alex's law license in September 2021. Investigators dug deeper into Alex Murdaugh's life. They began to uncover several financial crimes, tax evasions, embezzlements, and misappropriation of funds from clients and his law firm. Alex left rehab on October 14, 2021, and was arrested again upon release. He was charged with two felony counts of obtaining property by false pretenses. The arrest was made based on an investigation into the misappropriation of investment payout from the wrongful death case of Gloria Satterfield. This time, Alex was denied bond. This was only the beginning of Alex Murdaugh's legal woes. On November 18, 2021, he was indicted on 27 counts of financial misconduct. He was accused of stealing money from his clients, other lawyers, and the family of his late housekeeper. On December 9, 2021, even more charges were brought against him. Another 21 counts were added to the tally, bringing the total to 48. The charges at the time included one count of forgery, four counts of money laundering, seven counts of computer crimes, nine counts of breach of trust with fraudulent intent, obtaining signature or property by false pretenses. It was estimated that Alex had stolen more than $6.2 million from his victims. The state's investigation into Murdaugh's business dealing took months to untangle with new charges brought against him almost daily. By June 2022, the charges against him totaled 81. By the time Alex was formally disbarred on July 13, 2022, he was already facing 84 criminal charges and 11 lawsuits. 
mother of the 19-year-old Mallory Beach, was among the many who brought a legal claim against the estates of Margaret and Paul Murdo. The enormity of these financial crimes raised questions about the character of the once prominent attorney. Could he be hiding something even more sinister? Perhaps the murder of his wife and son? If so, what could have possibly been his motive? The South Carolina Law Enforcement Division, SLED, decided to revisit what they knew and had accepted as facts about the double murder. They considered new information they gathered while investigating the numerous financial crimes of Alex Murdo. One of the first facts investigators realized was that all was not well in Alex and Maggie Murdo's marriage. The couple had hit a rough patch. Maggie was living apart from her husband in the family's beach home on Edisto Island, more than an hour away from the Moselle property. Marion Proctor, Maggie Murdo's sister, told law enforcement agents that Mary had not even planned to see her husband on the night of the murders. Alex reached out to Maggie on the fateful day, asking her to meet him at the family lodge. He asked Maggie to accompany him to visit his father, who was terminally ill and could pass away at any time. She was reluctant to go initially and was said to have messaged a friend saying that her husband's behavior was fishy and that he was up to something. She suggested that they meet at the hospital instead. Ultimately, she agreed to drive to the Moselle property before heading to the hospital to visit Alex's ailing father. Unfortunately, she was murdered before she had the chance to visit her father-in-law. Maggie and her younger son were shot dead at their Moselle property. The one 700-acre hunting lodge estate contained the Murdaw house, dog kennels, a cabin, and stretches of swampland. Maggie and Paul were found near the dog kennels, and they had been shot several times. Paul was shot twice with a shotgun, and Maggie had five gunshot wounds. She'd been killed with a different weapon, which ballistic analysis determined was a blackout 300 ammo from an AR-style rifle. Alex Murdo claimed that he had a long nap that day before leaving to see his ailing mother, who suffers from dementia. He said he was away for about 45 minutes to an hour and a half. And when he got back, he saw his wife and younger son dead on the floor near the dog kennels. Alex's timeline for the night had been laid down during a series of interviews with law enforcement. So up at the house, I laid down, took a nap on the couch. I left to go to my mom's. When I got back to the house, the house was obviously nobody was in there. So I figured they're still up here fooling around. I pulled up and I could see them. And, you know, I knew something was bad. While Alex was a person of interest in the eyes of law enforcement, they were still something missing. A motive as to why a prominent and influential lawyer would decide to kill his family. It wasn't long before they found what they were looking for. The South Carolina Law Enforcement Division, SLED, discovered that weeks before the murder, the state grand jury had subpoenaed Alex Murdaugh's finances. It was concerning an obstruction of justice investigation connected to a fatal 2019 boat crash involving Paul Murdo. Alex Murdo was scared that all his financial wrongdoings would be exposed following the hearing, which was scheduled for June 10th, 2021. To make matters worse, his law firm had discovered his misappropriation of company funds. Jean Seconder, the law firm's CFO at the time, had confronted Murdo about the missing money on June 7th, 2021, the day of the murder. State authorities claimed that the financial pressure had Alex rattled, and he feared his world would collapse. So he hatched a daring plan that would divert attention from his financial crimes, which were beginning to go public, and help garner sympathy for him in the public eye. July 14, 2022, 13 months after the fatal shooting of Maggie and Paul, Alex Murdo was charged with the murders of his wife and son. The start of the murder trial of Alec Murdoch, the once prominent South Carolina baby. Murdo was charged with two counts of murder, and possession of a weapon during the commission of a violent crime. The prosecutors claimed that Murdo had shot and killed his wife and son at close range with a shotgun and an AR-style rifle. The murder weapons were never found. Murdo's defense team argued that two shooters carried out the shootings due to the different weapons used. Expert witness for the defense also stated that based on the trajectory of the bullets, the likely height of the shooters was between 5 foot 4 inches and 5 foot 2 inches. Alex stood at the proud height of 6 foot and 4 inches, which disqualified him as a suspect. Whoever shot 
shot, this shot, or these shots, well, first of all, the quail bag shot was 5-2 to 5-4. That is the most likely explanation, yes. The expert witness, under cross-examination, was grilled by the prosecutors and later admitted that there were other possibilities, apart from the height scenario painted, that could have caused the trajectory of the bullet. Ballistic determined that Maggie was shot with a 300 blackout ammo from an AR-style rifle. Investigators found a box of 300 blackout ammo in the Murdoch family estate. State prosecutors argued that Murdoch killed his wife and son to gain sympathy and escape accountability for his string of financial crimes. Murdoch's lawyers ridiculed the idea, asking why he would shift a financial investigation away from himself in order to avoid scrutiny by putting himself in the spotlight of a murder investigation. In the course of the trial, it was revealed that Alex Murdo had been a person of interest since the start of the South Carolina Law Enforcement Division, a SLED, investigation into the murders. According to Dick Harputlian, Murdo's lawyer, he had an ironclad alibi for the night in question and also had no reason to kill Maggie and their younger son, Paul. He described Alex and Maggie's marriage as full of love. The prosecutors then presented two videos recorded of Alex on the night of the murder, taken a few hours from each other. One was a Snapchat video taken off Paul's phone, and the other was a body cam of one of the law enforcement agents at the scene of the crime. The footage you're seeing is from a Snapchat video that was taken off of Paul's phone earlier in the night before the murders. Now compare that to what Murdoch is wearing later on in the evening after the killings. Something immediately stood out. The outfits in the two videos were different. The blue shirt is seen in the Snapchat video that was taken roughly one hour before the murders and was different from what Alex was wearing, as seen in the body cam recording of the officer. The investigators claimed a search for the blue shirt was unsuccessful. It was nowhere to be found. Prosecutors suggested that Murdo tried to influence the key witnesses' accounts by asking her if she remembered the shirt he was wearing that night. He was pacing back and forth in the, in the living room, and he said, I got a bad feeling. There was a video that was out, and he said, you remember the shirt I was wearing, that Vinny Vine shirt? In my mind, I was saying, I don't remember Vinny Vine's shirt. It was the polo shirt. I didn't really know whether he was trying to get me to say that that was the shirt he was wearing. Cell phone data from Murdaugh's phone showed he was at his mother's home for only 15, 20 minutes. This was further corroborated by the testimony of Alex Murdo's mother's caregiver, who stated he stayed for only 15, 20 minutes before leaving. Murdo claims to have stayed for at least 45 minutes. I was probably gone an hour and a half from my mom's. How long did he stay in the room with y'all? I say y'all, for the record, you and Miss Libby, I apologize. About 15 to 20 minutes, 20 minutes. The most crucial piece of evidence was found late in the investigation. When going through Paul's phone, which was recovered at the scene, they found a video that Paul recorded at 8.44 p.m., minutes from the time investigators believed the murders happened. The murder occurred between 8.49 to 9.06 p.m., according to state authorities. The video on Paul's phone was recorded in the dog kennels. The audio featured three distinct voices. Family and friends were called to identify the voices. The voices were determined to be Paul's, Maggie's, and Alex's. This placed Murdo in the vicinity when the murders occurred. At this point, the ironclad alibi that Murdo relied on was completely destroyed. He had claimed he was never at the dog kennels that night. During the fifth week of the trial, Murdo took the stand and reiterated that he could never have intentionally hurt his wife and son. He testified, I didn't shoot my wife or son. He admitted that he had lied about his alibi. Murdo's new story was that he had an opioid addiction at the time and was prone to paranoia, and that was the cause of his lie to the law enforcement agents. Prosecutors suggested that after Murdo killed his wife and son, he then took her phone and made a series of calls and texts to the device to help build his alibi. One text read, Call me babe. It was sent at 9.47. Cell phone data also showed that Murdo and his wife's phone locked within seconds of each other. 
Another piece of evidence presented to the jury based on data from Alex's cell phone was that within the time frame of when the murder occurred, Alex suddenly took a lot of steps. Prosecutors attribute this to him trying to hide or dispose of evidence that would link him to the murder. Murdo's lawyers discredited this claim by pointing out that the steps recorded on Alex's phone did not match that of his wife's. So it is wrong to think he picked up his wife's phone after the shootings. Ultimately, the video Paul recorded at the dog kennels provided the decisive evidence by which the case was determined. The jury reached a verdict in three hours on March 2nd, 2023. The jury found Alex Murdo guilty on all counts. He was sentenced to two life sentences to run consecutively without the possibility of parole. The jury also convicted him of two counts of possession of a weapon during a violent crime, which added another five years to his sentence. Murdo pleaded guilty to 22 counts of financial crimes as part of his deal, but continues to stand by his claim of innocence in the murder of his wife and son. On March 9, 2023, he filed a notice to appeal his double murder conviction. In a surprising turn, Murdo's lawyers filed a motion seeking a new trial after allegedly uncovering evidence of jury tampering by Rebecca Hill, which she has now denied. Rebecca was a Coleton County clerk of court and was accused of tampering with the jury by advising them not to believe Murdo's testimony and other evidence presented by the defense, pressuring them to reach a quick guilty verdict and even misrepresenting critical and material information to the trial judge in her campaign to remove a juror she believed to be favorable to the defense. A hearing would be convened for Murdaugh's lawyers to present evidence and witnesses to support their claim. However, a judge is yet to be selected to preside over the hearing. With Murdo's appeal, over a hundred financial and drug crime charges and multiple pending lawsuits, we can be sure that we have not heard the last of Alex Murdo.